focus of this module is the potash industry and I'll give an overview of the industry, the types of potash that it produces and we'll look at some price trends over the last decade or two. Potash, as the term is used today, describes different types of potash fertilizers and of course potash fertilizers are the third major plant and crop nutrient group after nitrogen and phosphorus. Now small amounts of the potash salts are also used in the manufacture of various potassium bearing chemicals, detergents, ceramics, pharmaceuticals, water conditions and as an alternative to halite as a de-icing salt. But we're going to focus in on the geology of potash and the different extraction and processing techniques for the different minerals that are extracted from either brine or from the earth. Potassium, the element itself, is quite common. It makes up something like 3.1% of the earth's crust and it's found in numerous minerals such as feldspar, mica, glauconite and it's also found dissolved in oceanic water where it makes up between 0.4 and 0.7% of oceanic water. And of course it's this dissolved oceanic component that when seawater is concentrated ultimately leads to the deposition of the various potash salts as bittern salts. Now the name potash came from the old manufacturing technique of boiling the washings of wood or broadleaf trees in large pots, hence the name pot ash, and we recovered lye. Now lye describes sodium hydroxide and potash lye is potassium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide has been used since the 15th century in the manufacture of softer or higher grade facial soaps. Potash lye was also used in glass and is still used in glass manufacture and textile bleaching. And as far back as ancient pre-Roman times, potash lye was used in glass manufacture. And here we can see a glass medallion from the 3rd or 4th century AD depicting a Roman family in Alexandria in Roman Egypt. Today the term potash describes not the washings of ashes but a series of mined and manufactured salts which are used to produce a variety of fertilizers. The major sources of the various potash salts are potassium chloride also known as muriate of potash or MOP, potassium sulfate known as sulfate of potash or SOP, the sulfate of potash magnesia SOPM, potassium nitrate known as saltpeter and also Chilean saltpeter from the sodium nitrate potassium nitrate salt and these are different usages of the term potash to its original usage describing various potassium carbonate and potassium hydroxide salts recovered in an iron pot by the boiling of water leached wood ash. Occurrences of the various potash salts can be divided into two basic sets of processes and associations. These are the brine sourced versus the solid or rock ore sourced forms of the potash salts. The yellow stars on this map indicate the brine sources whereby various types of hypersaline brines are processed to manufacture potash salts. Either muriate of potash as in dibuxum or sulfate of potash as in lopnur and the various North American brine sourced processing plants. The solid ore sources tend to be pre-quaternary and are mostly associated with a sylvanite or a sylvite rather than a carnalite or carnalitic ore source. And this map encompasses the various deposits we will discuss in the subsequent brine extraction and the solid ore extraction modules. If we look at the mined or solid ore sources of potash, most of the larger deposits occur in strata bound, relatively flat lying to gently dipping units. And such units can extend for hundreds to hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. Potash mines tend to, potash mines tend to be deeper than 800 to 1000 meters in depth. And this relates to the fact that as we get closer to the surface, potash salts being highly soluble tend to be dissolved before the subcropping potash salts ever weather to the earth's surface. There are exceptions to this in the hyperarid parts of the world in Iran, Ethiopia and Eritrea. And we'll look at examples of this in the subsequent modules. Because of this high solubility, potash deposits 
tend to be better preserved if they are overlain by relatively impermeable sediments that prevent the entry of meteoric waters from the surface. Most present day potash deposits are developed using conventional mining methods down to depths of 1200 meters or so, which is the current limit of anthropogenic mining, whereas solution mining methods can extend the depth of recovered potash salts to around 2500 meters. At greater depth, the problem becomes flowing salt. Higher overburden pressure loads that deeply buried potash unit and the encasing halite unit, and that stress sets up plastic flow problems where we see creep both of the mine wall and of the edges of solution cavities tending over time to close up those artificial openings associated with mines and solution cavities. The deeper we go, the greater is the likelihood of problems related to salt creep. Current limits of mining for that reason are around 1200 meters and current limits of solution cavities is around two and a half kilometers. And we discuss this more in the module dealing with salt flow and salt creep. In terms of size of the potash deposits, the flat bedded strata pound deposits, as exemplified by the Canadian prairie evaporite deposits, can be quite large. Individual potash deposits in that situation of stratiform bedded targeted units can have more than 200 million metric tons of K2O equivalent as a reserve. If we have flowing salt or halokinetic salt or diapyric salt containing our targeted salt units, then because of the nature of that flow, they tend to be smaller than the strata bound deposits. In terms of ore grade, the range of K2O equivalent potash grades ranges from 5.3 to 38%, typically with modern mining cutoff grades of between 8 and 10%. But of course, this depends on the economics at the time, what is the price of potash, how much state subsidy is there in the potash mining, and so on. Ore grades are dependent on the mineralogy of the targeted potash mineral. For example, silverite contains 63.2% K2O, whereas carnalite, which is not a pure potassium chloride salt, but a potassium chloride magnesium salt, contains around 16.9% K2O equivalent. And of course, ore grades also are going to be dependent on the level of contaminants such as halite and other salts in the ore horizon. In terms of targeting ore, some ore textures are better than others. The best ore is a mixture of sylvite and halite where we have intercrystalline and layered clay distributions which are susceptible to removal by flotation following crushing and we'll discuss that in more detail a little later in this module. There's really five targeted ore salts in modern potash mines. Uh, the prime ore source, the preferred ore source, because of the relative ease of processing of the ore is a sylvite or a mixed sylvite halite sylvanite ore source. Then there are the carnalytic salts, the canonitic salts, the langbanite salts and the polyhalite salts. There are very few potash mines in the world that today target carnalite and canite. There are operational mines in New Mexico targeting langbanite and there are also a, an expanding possibility as exemplified by the York mine in the UK where polyhalite is the main ore source. All of the double salts are problematic. Canite, carnalite, langbanite, and polyhalite because they tend to have more expensive processing requirements than the sylvanitic ore source. Because we have a range of potash minerals being used to manufacture fertilizer, we need a standardized measure of the quality of that potash content in those fertilizers. And so the industry established a standard which is the equivalent percentage of potassium oxide. Myriad of potash has a K2O equivalent of 60% or higher, sulfate of potash 51% or higher, and the double sulfate of potash magnesia has a K2O standard of 22% or higher. So if we look at the different K2O levels of the various potassium sourcing minerals, we can see that sylvite has the highest with 63.2% K2O equivalent, followed by canite at 19.3 and the carnalytic chloride salt at 16.9. For the sulfates, we have langbanite and leonite, 22 and 25% respectively. And then we have uh, schoenite and glazerite, which are byproducts, or sorry, which are targeted salts in the manufacture of sulfate of potash in the Great Salt Lakes, with contents of 42 and 23%, and then polyhalite at 15.6 K2O equivalent.
Most ore salts are combinations of salts. And so we use the term sylvanite, which is a combination of sylvite and halite, which has a K2O range of between 10 and 35% potassium oxide equivalent, and then a range of uh, other salts, and these names typically come from the German potash mines. Hart salts, which is a combination of sylvite, halite and hydrite, and bischofite, carnalitite, which is a combination of sodium chloride and carnalite. Langbenonite, which is a combination of langbenite and sodium chloride, as you can see with much lower K2O equivalent. And then we have the Misch salts, which is a combination of the Hart salts plus carnalite, and Kainatite, which is a combination of Kainite plus sodium chloride. And you can see that there's a range of K2O values for each of these or salt associations, and there's a range of occurrences lifted on the right hand side of here for the type occurrences of these various mineralogical forms. There's also potassium nitrate, which is no longer a typical target, but it was found as Chilean saltpeter and saltpeter in the desert soils of the Atacama Desert. And at the beginning of the 1900s, it was a major targeted source of potassium nitrate, typically for gunpowder manufacture rather than for fertilizer. Then we have a range of associated minerals with no K2O content, but form contaminants and accessories in a variety of targeted ore salt horizons. Potash mining began in the 14th century where in the hydrothermal potash deposits of the Dalol region of Ethiopia, we had mining taking place. In the mid 1800s, the Germans discovered significant quantities of potash in salt diapyric structures in the Zechstein Basin onshore. And a few years after that, German scientists had determined the usefulness of potash as a fertilizer in a variety of plants, fruits, vegetables, etc. In the US, the first documented use of potash as a fertilizer was in the 1870s, and the use of fertilizer had become so widespread that there were, by the mid-1930s, numerous potash mines worldwide. And as we'll see a little later, our ability to feed an ever-expanding world's population will be totally dependent on the increasing usage of potash along with nitrogen and phosphorus to support an ever-expanding need to feed the world's population. Historically, in the 1800s and the early 1900s, carnalite was the targeted ore mineral, or carnalitite, a combination of carnalite and halite. And it was processed to manufacture fertilizer in Germany for more than 130 years. Now, that use of carnalite or carnalitite as the prime also was only economic as long as the German Zechstein mines were supplying a significant portion of the world's potash markets. With the advent of sylvanite as a targeted ore source in Canada and elsewhere, the targeting of carnalite became uneconomic, and so the carnalite producing mines and processing plants closed, and only those that could mine and extract sylvanite in Germany remained open. The focus of the potash industry mining source using sylvite shifted to Canada and to Russia by the middle of last century. As we said earlier, the main use of the mine potash is as agricultural fertilizer. And there are two main associations for economic production of potash fertilizer. And these are the muriate of potash and the sulfate of potash. Let's look first at muriate of potash, which dominates more than 85% of the potash currently utilized in agricultural fertilizer production. The disadvantage of MOP or sylvanite sourced sections is that this fertilizer contains chloride and that leads to problems with salinization as we'll see a little bit later. It's cheap, easy to manufacture, easy to mine and so it's widely used as the potassium source for most fertilizer applications on crops especially carbohydrate crops that are strong enough to withstand elevated chloride levels. It's a much less expensive form of potash fertilizer than sulfate of potash, but its continued use in more arid regions of the world can lead to salinization problems in the soil. And we'll come back to this when we discuss sulfate of potash a little later. Mm -hmm. 